We did struggle with that to try and come across um, and at the same, same time it was a couple of steps forward, a step back, some things worked, some didn't. Um, until we finally figured out, and it wasn't actually until I just said I've had enough, no, and no more synthetics. And that, that was surprisingly, that's what did the trick when I said no more, and we just went for it. And, and, yes, <laughs> and, and it was for a while there, I was just tip, tiptoeing along, and it was just like this, this is crazy like, doubting yourself, doubting myself. I wasn't sure, <laughs> I was wanting. I wanted to get rid of it, I hated it, any sort of synthetic input and then and then trying to let go and then and, and, and in the end once I let go everything fell into place. And so I think like, that was a, something to take out of that. And that's something I'd love to be able to tell people that's what we need to do. And not to give up cold turkey, but to just gotta manage it. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. 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 The Biological Farming Roundtable podcast helps farmers explore innovative, low-input, regenerative and profitable farming systems. The Biological Farming Roundtable is sponsored by Nutrisoil, an award-winning biological liquid fertiliser made from a big worm farm. Nutrisoil's purpose is to empower farmers to produce life-enriching food. My name is Nicola Maddock. I work at Nutrisoil. I envisage a future where farmers are rewarded for producing nutrient-rich foods and consumers have this easily available to them. Hello everyone, Nicola here from Nutrisoil. I am here today with James Slattery, co-founder of Natural Intelligence Farming and Dale Retschlag from Central Queensland in Filawila. We came up to Rockhampton to do an event, uh, Tapping into Natural Intelligence Farming with Di and Ian Haggerty. Uh, and Dale was the one that invited us up here. We did it in partnership with CQLA Alliance, which is a really progressive farming group up here in central Queensland in regenerative agriculture. Um, we've had a great day and we've just now been out on Dale's farm and had a really good intense session with a couple of people who were sort of hanging on from the day. Uh, so Dale, tell us firstly about your amazing group, CQ, Central Queensland. Yep, CQLA. Yes, CQLA. Yep, CQLA. <laughs> uh, yeah, so the group formed back in 2020 and it was just a group of friends that we all just got together and we're all into the regenerative, um, going down the regenerative pathway and, and we just, we felt that there was a need to do it as a group to get that um, support from each other and so it was a close group to start with we only had nine of us in it and uh, as we got going we just realized like there was a need for it and it was a calling and, and, and from there it's just growing so as we stand today we've got well, up until yesterday we had 65 members and that's i think that's increased a fair bit over the, <laughs> over the course of the day yesterday so uh yeah that's what it was about it was about bringing regenerative um, education to central Canada. It was a great day. So we had Diane and, and Jane talking on their farming system and the importance of um, working with nature and working with people, which is the side that Jane works with. Mm. But we also had Emma from your group working, uh, talking to us about holistic health and mm. connecting that. And some of the conversations that came out of the day and the things that we talked about in such a large group was amazing. Mm. Like you're very, you're a very open and progressive group. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, the idea when we formed the group, like what, what do we stand for? And that was the biggest, what, what do we really want out of this? And we spent a lot of time talking about it and what we decided had to be a community orientated group. Like it wasn't just for farmers, it's everyone involved. And that's where Emma came in. Emma's not, the family's from a farming background, but she's not a farmer herself. So she works on that human health element that I think is lacking. And that's where we're all doing. Like a lot of time farmers forget that they're producing uh, food you know, that, that we actually have to consume and, and, and at the end result sometimes is detrimental to our health, not sometimes but just about everywhere is detrimental to our health now. So Emma brought that to us, like she, she could, she's been studying it for a long time, she's working with it and she's talking about the gut microbiome and, and, and that just played along with where we're going with the regenerative process. So having her here is part of it, that's, that's, that's part of bringing the community together. So that's, that's why we've got her in there. Absolutely, just uh, how the disconnection of microbes in the human body can mm. cause illness and the disconnection of microbes in the soil is also causing the soil illness. Mm. And the connection that it's actually humans, the decisions yes. that humans are making yes. that's causing this. Um, and this, yeah, the regenerative movement is bringing uh, people's decision making, 
um, people's the awareness of health and farming all together. And it's just absolutely amazing. Yes, yeah. that's right. Firstly, I'd like to hear Dale how you came to regenerative agriculture because you weren't always uh, you were quite a conventional farmer. Yeah. Yep. So uh, yeah, I started um, grew up on a dairy farm, small beef farm in, in Kilcoy, South East Queensland, um, and I was fortunate enough that my grandfather was still uh, traditional in his farming methods and, that, and traditional I meant he, he, he was against chemicals and, and synthetic fertiliser inputs. He liked to do it the, the old fashioned way so that was rotation in crops, livestock, multiple different animals and so seeing that I was only young and I can, I can always remember it you know, and, and so we went on to with my father's generation where they pursued the synthetics and the high, higher production in the landscape going to monocultures, that type of thing. And so I actually was fortunate enough to witness the change. And and that was sort of what sparked a lot of the interest for me. So I always wanted to be able to... I couldn't understand why, like why we couldn't do it like the old way, why we had to be putting in so many inputs. And I farmed traditionally like that, so we were on the dairy for years, bought the dairy after deregulation, left the dairy, and then ended up buying a Lucent farm in central Queensland, uh, Idesvold, so a small um, irrigation block, it was only small. And we started doing hay, hay production there, just cutting small squares. And that started doing it the same way. But I was fortunate enough when I went there to meet a really nice old agronomist called Tony DeVille. And Tony was the one that started me on the regen path. He started to get me to question why we do what we do and, and made me think about where we headed with this. So, um, that was interesting, and, and he's most, um, I think the most profound influence he had on me was when he first suggested that I, I was complaining about using an excessive amount of insecticides on the loosen, and, and uh, he just said it was management, and I, I couldn't understand what he was talking about. I said, well, I'm doing it when it's supposed to be done, and he said, no, no, he said, your place is too neat, he said, you're not letting um, beneficial insects attack and, and suppress the... Uh, um, the, the predators in the, and, he, and he'd end up just telling me he said just change your method so he said just keep some of the place so that there's a, a part of the place unmowed so that the beneficials can live somewhere and then they can support um, you in, 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 in the endeavours to try and, and suppress any insects that pressure you have so I was doing six to seven sprays a season on this lease and just to keep it under control thinking I was doing a good job then I went over to his method and what he told me to do and then all of a sudden I'm down to one spray. And so that was my moment when I realised, yeah, we've got to change what we're doing. So all of a sudden it was a win-win, not only financially, but just in the management, everything else was right. I, had to, I didn't have to be around chemicals, which is just something I didn't agree with. And it's got to the point now that we've moved further on from that, that it, like I can still grow loose and no, I'm not cutting it, I'm just grazing it, but I've got insects in there, but I don't have problems with insect attack. They're not doing anything that can cause me to ever want to spray. So that was just building that system, and that was the start of it back then. We've uh, been able to go out and, and look at your farming system today. We've had a lovely drive around, some sit in the paddocks with, with some friends of yours in the group. Um, Jane, you first came across the cattle and, and realised that there were some things that we could observe that might have helped Dale. Um, what type of things do you think uh, we saw and, and what did we work through? Well, when we drove out there, we could see that the cattle weren't well moving, so they weren't really happy. And Dale explained, because of the extensive growth and trying to manage the grazing of so they're basically in I mean I was just learning about this today but it was a stage three pasture and so they were probably really wanting what was they'd been cut off from um, but they still had a lot that they needed to work through there they just didn't seem settled in themselves and they all knew that um, but it was how do we I was trying to probably get everybody or more so Dale just to look at it from a different perspective and what other ways could we maybe get them to utilise that pasture that's in there because it all looks fine um, and there is that diversity and so we started talking about um, maybe what things can be changed through the caretaker to see what response we can get back and whether the, the animals would respond 
whether they would indicate something different by doing, um, yeah, but just, just by the, the caretaker understanding something that maybe they hadn't understood before. Uh, how do you normally manage your pasture, pasture Dale? Is it just grazing or are you putting any inputs out there? Yeah, so I'll just take it back a step. Uh, so when we came to this place, I was well and truly un, in the regen journey by then and, and I, I realised that the quickest way to get to a healthier soil is to reintroduce livestock. So this place was doing crops and cattle, but a, a lot of the irrigation areas was all just crops. So turning that back over to livestock. So, and then straight away we went into a, a, um, a multi-species system and just grazing it. And uh, so we just, we just run a rotation cell grazing system um, and, and just get the cattle to do the work. So they, they're getting, speeding up the nutrient cycling process. And it was a system uh, that, that's very basic. I'm, I'm big on just keeping it very simple um, and work, work, work with the livestock so that they're trying to keep them in, in harmony, like to work with them, not against them. So that's in, in my own way. So we use working, good working dogs that are soft in, in nature as well. Not, they're not hard, not aggressive animals. So that's just, so they're there just to, to um, usher the mob when you shift them. They're not actually there to force them. And then that's, that's a big thing of part of it. So we, we do a shift every day, shifting cattle through the pastures. Um, and and at the moment we're just trying to go over to a more of a perennial base in our pastures, just one for efficiency, but also one to get um, more diversity into the system. Are you oversowing those perennials? Yeah, so we've got a, yeah, a perennials and then we do a winter oversow, so it's a 12 to 13 way mix depending on it, and it's something we play with every year, just still trying to get a, a better thing and I'm trying to balance what the cattle want to get a, a better diet for them and, and better diet I mean like to balance the protein energy with the fibre content it's something I've had a bit of a challenge with especially towards the latter part of winter and it's not when you when you've got a lot of uh, uh, high energy plants growing and then not a lot of fibre in it um, and so we, we do that and then we've basically given up all synthetic use. We stopped that several years ago, so we were still applying it and it was a hard step to go across initially, but as we got into it further and I understood how soils function more, it became a lot easier. So now it's just, it's just using um, vermicast um, extract um, and um, a little bit of fish and a few other amendments and some, some trace minerals in it and that's basically all it gets now. And what was the hard part? You said it was hard to transition yeah. from your synthetic fertilizer. Yeah, well, it's interesting, and, and this is nothing against previous owners or anything like that, but the place was managed just how most farms conventionally were, so it was high inputs over the years, synthetic use, and, and the soils on the chemical side of things were very out of balance. So it was just um, completely in a way that the soil shouldn't really function or very low, very low quality of feed was coming off it and even with synthetic inputs it was limiting so the, the hard thing was to try and build biology and good biology and trying to get that fungi in the soil built up so that you can get that functioning better and of course like livestock is part of it but it, it did help but not enough so um, that was our big challenge so it was just trying to get weaned off synthetics maintain production because none of this is um, it's all irrelevant if you can't stay profitable. So we had to try and maintain profitability. So yeah, maintain profitability while you're transitioning transition. from the artificial to the exactly natural. Exactly right, yeah. Jane. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. And that was the big challenge. So, and and, and it, did, it did. We did struggle with that to try and come across. Um, and at the same same time, it was a couple of steps forward, a step back. Some things worked, some didn't. Um, until we finally figured out and it wasn't actually until I just said I've had enough no, and no more synthetics and that, that was surprisingly that's what did the trick when I said no more and we just went for it. And, Non-negotiable. And, yes <laughs> and, and it was for a while there I was just tip, tiptoeing along and it was just like this This is crazy. Like, doubting yourself. Doubting myself. I wasn't sure. <laughs> I was wanting I wanted to get rid of it. I hated it. Any sort of synthetic input and then and then trying to let go and then and, and, and in the end once I let go everything fell into place and it's all people like that was a something to take out of that and that's something I'd love to be able to tell people that's what we need to do and not to give up cold turkey but you've just got to back this off and that's going back to what our regen group does that's what we are about is to try and offer that support and uh, and, and, and and also back yourself but believe in yourself believe right. in believe yeah yeah 
start to actually connect that's right. with that that wisdom, mm -hmm. that natural intelligence. Yeah, that's right. And I honestly, yeah, I, I believe that I, I didn't back myself enough. I, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I doubted what I was like. I I never doubted that the system, but I doubted my ability to do it on my place, and uh, that that's probably was my downfall on any on anything the decision I made. So yeah, in the future it was just like have the confidence, back yourself. You know it's going to work. We know we're doing the right thing. We're doing good for not only the soil, the animals. It'll all fall in place. And the animals look amazing, mm. and the pasture really does look amazing, yeah. especially when we drove over that <laughs> when we drove over that section, and our skills got out the car and went. Oh, wow, that's amazing. When we that. started going into that paddock, our conversation started to get even better. I don't know if you noticed oh, that. Oh, you did. But it we did. started to open up and it was just that feeling of opening up into that beautiful paddock. Mm -hmm. um, but I want to talk about you. You arrived and you said it was very run down. Even when you look at your soil test, you're high magnesium soil and you're low sulfur, is that right? Um, yeah, so yeah, um, sulfur is low. There's a lot, lot. There's basically, honest. If you do a conventional soil test, there's nothing in the middle. Yeah. It's either too excessive or too low. Yeah. I've got nothing. It was just like if I could just find one that was in the middle, it would have been nice. But it was just so out of balance. Yeah, you got no balance. That's just what I was going to yeah. say. You got no balance. Nothing at all. <laughs> and, and you're just like, and you and you talk to a conventional agronomist, and they say, well, let's start with the most limiting factor, and. You think, well, you know, how we can afford to do that? Like, we've got to address this calcium issue. You know, we've got low boron as well, and it just went on and on and on. And and we just like, we could do it, but it's going to come at great expense. Mm. And and that's when the biology was the game changer. So that that's that's when we could say, well, you we could finally let go. And when you and where we fell down was a bit was when we're still using synthetic, which is actually inhibiting the biology. And that's that was the handbrake. So we've got one foot on the accelerator and the other one's got the handbrake, still got the handbrake off. So once we let the handbrake off, we're away. Yeah. Yeah. Do you know, Dale, any parts of your farm or your neighbours where they haven't done uh, aggressive uh, cropping, high input? Is it still high magnesium soils, high pH? Is that just the natural way of the land here? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so yeah, it's on a floodplain, so yeah, it's just the alkaline soils. Yeah, so that is the nature of the beast. But it's also, um, and it's just been, um, it's just been magnified with, with synthetics to, to create a bigger problem. So, so previous owners uh, weren't able to address it. It's like they're all just about trying to get the next crop off, which is understandable. Everyone's just trying to make, make a bit out of it. So, but yeah, someone has to change it, otherwise it just becomes unviable. Mm -hmm. We talked out in the paddock that this is the natural landscape here and these are the natural soil types and amazing abundant grass grows here without trucks of lime coming out <laughs> so it really wasn't a profitable option to start trying to balance that soil. Yeah it was a, it was going to be a, a very expensive and a long road a long and expensive road to go down if you want to do it and I mean it could be done and you may have to change your farming what, what you're going to produce to Maybe you have to go under a more intensive system to, to increase production, but that wasn't me. Like my heart's really just working livestock. That's my thing. I um, wouldn't say that I'm a cropping person at all. But, uh, I just I love growing good quality feed, and I just want to and I, I shift cattle all day long. That's my passion. With good working dogs, you can't beat that. Yeah. The pastures were beautiful. Oh, they were in some areas, absolutely. And I think with your high rainfall, you had said some of them had gone past the stage that you wanted to, and that's why the cattle were in that sort of stage three mm. paddock. Um, so the way you were managing it was you were letting them graze, and then you were slashing it, mm. uh, and then moving them on. So it was a bit of a stage where you were just using them to get reset. Yeah, it was yeah. a reset, and this is something I've never had to do. And I mean, this is a problem. One, we had a really good season. But also, our soils are changing, so I just find that all of a sudden I just need more cattle like, to, to try and do what I'm still doing. So I'm just growing more quality feed, and the weight gain is better now than it was 12 months ago. So it's just like, that's all comes down to biology, it's all falling into place. So all of a sudden I've got a good problem, I've got excessive feed, which can be solved with more, more animals. And that's, just, and that's all that was, and it, it, such a good summer, high rainfall. Uh, it got away on me, so and that's the first time I've ever had to actually slash or mow grass to try and get it back under control. Uh, I'm just like, and probably a good problem to have. But, mm. uh, 
that that's just what, what we had to do, and that's where you're seeing it today is, is just a, an example of something that we've had to um, address. It's not a bad problem, but it's it's just something that. Um, well, you've got to be adaptable. Adaptable, and you've yeah. got to yeah. It's not a, a set program. No, that's You've got to work with what the conditions are and go with the flow. And that's what I find, Jay, and I, with what we're trying to do here. It, it works so much better if you can stay flexible, mm -hmm. and that's in your whole grazing program. Don't be too regimental with it. Then I, I just find that it's so much easier if you just let it go. Um, it's got to be graze hard, graze hard. But if you if you go a, a light graze, that's fine, and that's how nature works. It's up and down, it's round about. Take the good with the bad, and, yeah. and I find that's that that's fine. Don't stress over that, and that's one thing I don't stress over too much. As long as I know I've got the feed in front of me, that's all fine. If you get a light graze, heavy graze, or how you do it. Providing your cattle are moving across the landscape, it'll all work out. And you did actually mention that you do have an indicator with your cattle that there is something that you watch, yeah. which is a bit of a guide for you. Yeah, so there's a, yeah, yeah, James. So there's a couple of things I watch, and that's um, firstly, how are they settled? You know, when you go to shift the electric fence, I do it at the moment. I'm only once a day. Sometimes in the winter, I'll do it twice a day. And uh, once a day, I find uh, you go out there, and if they're looking at you when you come over towards the gate you know that they're missing something. They're not happy or like we saw today, they're restless, they're bowing, you know, there's a few making them. They're, they're just hecklers really, like they're not happy, they're not, they're not making a big noise, but they're making They're just noise. talking to you. Yeah, they're telling yep. them, you know, like, come on, <laughs> this isn't funny anymore, sort of thing. So yeah, that's, that's, what I, that's the first indicator. That's the first thing I look at. And um, you can pick it straight away. Once you get in tune with your cattle, the cattle are telling you what you want or what they want, and, and you just gotta be able to react to it. So. Normally that's just whether they've been not fed enough. And if you go to shift them and they don't want to move, so all of a sudden the dogs are struggling to move them, then you know, well, okay, they got everything they wanted. They're they need of, to stay Yeah, they're them. still rubbing the sleep out of their eyes. They don't really want to get going. So that's that's a great <laughs> sign. Like I just, I love to see that. And, and it's and it's very calming across there. The dogs are even calmer when that's happening. So everybody, yeah, and so you've got that. The second thing I look at is, is their flanks. So usually like how full they are. So. Normally, if they're restless, you can just tell straight away. Then you have a look at their, their, their gut, it's not full. They're not getting what they want or they haven't had sufficient um, intake of what they need. And the third one is the manure, which is a really important one. So how, how is it soft, hard, and that gives you an idea of where you, you know, the protein or whether there's the energy there to, in, the, in the plants to break down the protein or yeah, the fibre. So that's, that's the three things that I look at. And that's, if you can keep them in balance and keep it where I want to be, you usually go okay. Yeah, and so if they were standing in grass that's up to their bellies or above and the manure was too firm, yes. you would just move them on because that's right. they're, yeah, that's they're signalling right. that... And that's where I'm at now, like yeah. that's why, and then that's why the mower is following the, the, the grazing because to get rid of that grass, to get it back down, to get it regrowing into that, you know, where it's more, uh, more uh, palatable to the stock. Yeah. yeah, so you're making up the difference for the extra cows that mm. you don't have at the moment. Yeah. Yeah. And, a, and a, a big <laughs> Good thing, management. Yeah. and it's something I don't, and I, and you could look at it as like, oh, well, it didn't work out too well this time, but I'm a big believer in, in, in reduced input, especially with machinery. Like, I shouldn't, like if I was a good manager, like I stayed on the ball with this, but today I wouldn't have to be running a mower there, you know, if I had sufficient stock, and that's what I try to aim for, that, that I'm burning diesel that I shouldn't really have to if, if, if I had the livestock to do the job. But it's just the way the season turns Yeah, out. but I probably disagree with that because yeah. you're doing what you need to do. You're in transition. Yeah. And you, you're not in a situation where you can just go and get the extra stock. Mm. You've got to work with what you're working with. You're still trying to build up and make sure you've got plenty of feed. Yeah. Um, you know, better to have too much than not mm. enough. Mm. Mm. Better to, for you to go in and do some slashing or mowing. Yeah. Um, or, you know, go and get too many and then all of a sudden find you've got enough. Yeah. So you're just trying to, to work a balance with your right. system. Yeah. And like I said, it's so, probably not a bad problem. Like no, it's better not. Be it's actually that. a good it's yeah, it's, it's, it's on the right. I'm on the right side of the feed scale. Yeah. I'd, I'd rather be on that side than have them standing there bellowing the next morning because they didn't get enough the day before. That's yeah. that'd be enough to cause a bit of stress. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And then from doing that slashing, you noticed that there, there was a lot of smothering of the green plants, and they probably weren't coming through as quickly as you liked. So mm. you talked about the potential of maybe putting out some molasses to break down um, that grass that was a bit. It, it, it wasn't really nutritious anymore and, and they just needed a bit of encouragement to break it down, maybe the cattle to eat it as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 
And we talked about you not doing that all the time, but it was just this situational time that you That's might right. choose to do something like that. Yeah, and it's it's one of those things that we could say, oh yeah, we could have, if that just lies there forever, you have nitrogen tie up and all of that sort of things. But you think, well, if we could introduce something that could assist the microbial activity to, to break that down, whether it is a molasses, an energy source, something like that, or you know, just a crop digester of some sort to, to to basically uh, speed up with the nature side. Yeah, the breakdown of the, yeah. of the fibre. Yeah. So ideally you would love it to go through the cow again. Yeah, it would be fine. ideal. But that's, so that's, the best option would be to go through the stock. The second best option is to break it down really quickly and get it back going and get that cycle happening. Yeah. That nature, nature cycle. You did tell us about a time when molasses might not have worked so well for you and how you used it. Do you want to share that story? Oh, not really. <laughs> <laughs> No, I, I, I could see the benefits of molasses and I was putting a little bit in and, and I, I got talking to someone, I can't remember who it was now, but they were using larger amounts and, and, and I did try it. Um, and we'd been doing a few um, fungi bac bacteria tests and, and we were getting better because when we came here, of course, being synthetic based before we here and it was very bacterial dominant soils. What tests were you using? How are you testing the, the um, bacteria to fungi ratio? Just through um, the microbiome yep. test. And uh, we did it and, and yeah, it, it was coming up, like from the, the fungi was coming up, so it was coming from a fairly low base, so it was very bacterial dominant. And then we were, just through what we were doing, we were actually increasing it. So we got to the point where we were nearly 50-50, basically 50-50 on it. So it, was, it wasn't ideal, but it was getting better. And then we ended up applying too much molasses, so I, I made the mistake of too much of a good thing, went, went too far. Yeah, this is it works really well, let's just put a bit more on. And a bit more on. <laughs> and a bit more on, yeah, more on effect. And <laughs> away we went, and, um, and then all of a sudden I, I noticed on the next grazing, I didn't get the response that I was getting. So that was something, and, and I can't remember, but I remember the, the, the heifers weren't happy either, and I don't know, I can't remember at the time, but I remember something wasn't right, and I'm looking at it, something's not right, it's not growing, something's not lining up. So then I got another test done, and then all of a sudden the, the fungus right back down, the bacteria was dominated again, and, and yeah, I'd, so I'd, I'd upset the balance too much. So we had to go back to the drawing room, so I basically just gave up, to my, and then just kept doing everything else what I was doing, and then the latest test showed me we're back up to 50 50, so back to where I was. So, and that's only been in a nine month period mm. that has happened. So it turned around again really quickly. But yeah. it, it's it's a lesson learned, you know, you've just, you've got it. And, and, I'm, I'm, and I'm not beating myself up too much about it because I was happy that I was actually able to observe that. I sort of think, well, that was something that did good to come out of it, but I knew that there was a problem and we addressed it. So I was happy about that. Yeah. Yeah. And now you're using for your fertiliser, so once um, those green, green plants do come up out of that mulch, um, you'll go over with a worm liquid or a worm extract, what, what are you using? At the moment it's just a yeah, liquid extract yeah, and a little bit of fish, fish hydrosolate, so doing that. Um, and then I've run a couple of traces just as well um, when I have to, and um, so that, that's all that's really, that's all that's going into it. So. And when we do a plant, like so, to do a, a plant annual, then do it for a winter plant, it's, we, we run a, um, um, a seed coating, so that's with Johnson Sioux, um, and, and again some uh, liquid extract, some uh, worm juice, and plant with worm juice, so it's around 50 litres down the furrow, and then um, I, I give it a little bit of um, soft rock phosphate goes down the chute, so that's been activated um, as well. So just to get a bit of um, phosphorus happening there and a bit of calcium. Uh, and then after it's germinated, we go back over it with um, more worm juice. And I find that that works really well. That sort of two week period after planting, germination, hit it again, and that's when it really takes off. So and follow it with a little bit of fish, and that usually gets me through to the first grazing. And then after that, it's just one application between grazing, which is approximately every 30 days. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, and you've got your own worm farm. We went and had a look at it. You've done really well with that. Um, so how do you make the extract? So I, I keep it very basic. I, my idea, and I, I, uh, I spoke to a few different people, watched a lot of videos. That's where I've learned a lot of my things, just trying to follow people on, 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 on the internet. And, uh, and it came across this way of extracting it. And basically, it's, it's a simple, just put it into a, uh, 
a um, gauze bag that's used to compost teas and, and then just basically blow the, um, the extract, the biology off the extract. Um, and I do it straight away. So it's uh, basically into an open shuttle and I'm not sure, I think it's around 30 kilos of extract to go into that shuttle to get that thousand litres and then it's straight out. I put it out straight away. And uh, that's and it's something very simple, works really well, basic. Those little bags that they use probably only cost a couple of dollars, bought them online and um, yeah, simple and it works. Mm. Works really well. Have you noticed the difference between when you were using the synthetic fertilisers to now using the worm products? Any difference in um, biomass, health of cattle? Yeah, definitely uh, the cattle have responded a lot better. And what I've noticed is from the varying days, you know, everything was high inputs of uh, nitrogen. And I've read, you know, and you hear these stories about like there's a limit to synthetics. And that's what I've noticed this last year. Like, I think we would have put, have to put on an incredible amount of nitrogen to grow the feed that we're growing now. And it's just like there's a ceiling with nitrogen. Once you get to a point, it just cannot do any more. And I'm just thinking, this is what we're finding with the biology. This problem I've got at the moment with excess grasses, it's just taken off. It's just, I don't know where the ceiling would be with biology. I don't think anyone knows, but I'm just thinking if you can prime that system of getting going. And, and it's not just the growth, it's the quality. So we talk about bricks readings, probably because we've always had trouble with bricks here, low, low readings, you know, there's, there's, a, there's a lot of, not a lot of energy in the soil, something's not right, you know, and it's just trying to correct that and the biology is slowly bringing that up. So I don't think you'd ever get high bricks readings with, with, some, with the synthetic system at all. Yeah. And, and, and that shows with the cattle and the weight gains. Yeah, and they do look good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had a dig in your soil as well and it was, we found a few, a few plates so you could see it was a bit compacted mm -hmm. um, and we recognised that it was a high magnesium soil so um, you are having trouble with nodulation mm -hmm. yeah so we talked about other things that you could do there yes you could put out calcium but it's probably you've tried that and it hasn't increased it um, and then we really sat down in a big circle and had a really nice chat about other things that we could do uh, to really help that soil mm. along so the biology so when we talk about natural intelligence farming uh, there's the biology of, um, and the life force energy in the soil, uh, but really working with that has to do with the people. Um, I would say at the start, like I, I felt really confused like when James was trying to explain it, but it wasn't until actually we sat down on the ground, nice and calm, it, it did start to make sense. Like you look at what, what, what's going on, what are we doing? And, and why is this why is this happening? You know, and, and that, that that at the moment I think like that's where I've got to go next. I thought this is I got a lot out of that. You know, I, I still got a long way to go to understand it, but I thought that, that yeah, you certainly um, sparked my curiosity on that one. Yeah, and it was an interesting conversation mm. because there was some other people there that were with us. Mm. Um, so we had three females, four males, and it was just interesting the dialogue that mm. actually came from that. And how open? Oh, how open, yeah. 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 So, and uh, interesting, you needed to ground yourself. You needed yes. to sit on the ground. Yeah. yeah. It's something I haven't done for a long time. Mm. And, and, then to, and not only that, I mean, if we could have got the footage of the cattle, like we were probably, what, 20, 30 metres that, from yeah. them, and the cattle, all of a sudden, they just settled and they sat down as well. I mean, what's going on here? But we weren't focused on the cattle, no, were we? we had our backs turned off. We were, we were just loving our um, presence and energy. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And when we, we turned around, we were just sitting, sitting down and asking questions, like mm. we asked if it was appropriate, just to ask and understand a few things. Mm. And we were just in this little circle together, not even focused, not even looking at the cattle. Yep. And when everyone got up and turned around and looked, it was like, oh, wow, what's yep. happened there? And we just had to sit down, chewing the cattle. Yeah, just like that. They joined, they joined us. Yeah, yeah. it was great. You have had um, some health problems connected to clinical. Um, what type of things can't you work with anymore uh, because of that? Yeah, I, 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 I don't know where it started, but basically just I've had excessive chemical usage over the years from a very early age being around it. It was sort of when they didn't mean anything. There was never such a thing as PPE on chemicals. We grew up, and, and yeah, I think it just got to the level where my body just won't reject it, I won't, wouldn't do it anymore. And that's that's been a big driver of what we do now. Like, I just 
is to use chemicals would be an absolute last resort and it's sort of getting to the point now where I just where I just refuse to do it and, and I'm not organic and I have no intention of being organic but it's just that way and especially things like uh, fly control on cattle that that would have been a big issue because I, I for some reason that that one I'm susceptible to as far as um, you know, re rejecting that chemical I can't handle it at all why I don't know so I, I use organic um, products on it with some limited success but yeah it was good what you said to me to Jane, today Jane about how we could address that um, yeah. and, 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 and try and get around that problem that without having to use synthetics um, the, and, and the other side of that too is then it's so detrimental to dung beetles and, and going back to well, what's your soils doing you know and, and we've got to look after things like that they're, they're, so it's a balancing act up until now to try and figure it out and, and it's something that I was really frustrated with but um, that, that having that conversation was a, definitely uh, well it, worth, it was worth a lot to me today to hear that from you today, mm. yeah. That's great. and I know that you're over sowing so you're not spraying anything out tell me how you are adding these extra plants to your pasture yeah well that's something that I, I struggled with to start with so it was it used to be a spray then it was like this real light cultivation trying just just to suppress things not not to go too deep and it was still not right and, and, and so now I've got to the point where it, I learned that it's more about um, timing. Timing is so critical. So if you're doing an autumn plant, it's, you know, your, your summer species are coming to the end. So that, like the, the C4s or whatever they are, they're just, they're getting towards the end of their, heading towards their dormancy. So, you know, you don't go too early because you get some, um, you'll get some, too much competition from them. Same in the spring, we found if, if you go too late, you've got too much competition from summer, if you want to do a summer over, so and, and timing's critical and you just got to get a feel for it and no two seasons are the same. So if you did it on the 1st of October for a summer plant here, it doesn't mean next year you're going to have to do it on the 1st of October. It's just, it's the season will tell you and, that, you know, the, and the way the seasons run nowadays, it could be any time, so you've just got to be prepared. You know, a month either side of that. Yeah, and the plants will tend to that's try a, to do That's right, yeah. you can see it, and, and, if, and if you think, well, you can start to see a few summer plants, like species starting to stick their head and noses up, you think, well, you better get a hurry on. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and, and the same in the winter, you know, like if things are still powering along, well, you think, well, I'll just hold off a little bit longer. But if, if things are steadying up, well, it's less, less time to start drilling. You know, yep. Just get, get drill straight in there, and, and it just it just works so much quicker once, once that's happening. And your first grazing, it might look rough, you know, like in the old days, Everyone wouldn't have the nice perfect paddock of oats or ryegrass in, in a monoculture or mine. It's like the first grazing. I've got photos of there last year and there's still rose grass all through it and in amongst the ryegrass. And, and to me that looks great now, but from an outsider they'd think, what a mess. So, so your neat has now changed. Yeah, yeah, different type of neat now. <laughs> uh, and the more rugged it looks, the better it will probably be functioning. So, yeah. yeah, it looks beautiful really, it's yeah. that diversity. Yeah, and then you think, well, if you're doing your first graze in the winter and you've planted 13 species in there and you've still got five or six left over from summer that's that's not a bad mix and you know so a third of your your planting's free sort yeah. of thing so it's it's working and it's and that's that's what i enjoy now and mm. and you know the cattle are you see them in there and they, it's just it's it's like their birthday the day they go in there so. yeah well, it's the diversity they're yeah. in different you know mm. different well, they're actually getting different biology from their different plants. It's different right. nutrition from the different plants. That's um, right. Which is a bit like the free choice system that I used to work with, work with vitamin mineral yeah. supplements. We don't need those. We just work yeah. with the plants. That's right. Nice and natural. Yeah. Yeah, but it's interesting. Like I actually had a, a vet in here, and he was just growing a, 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 a um, just a single species of grass in fairly high intensity, and he was shocked. Like and, and amazingly smart man, and he just he said to me. Like, well, you're just giving them a choice. Like, and I'm like, yeah, I am. He could not believe that you could mix all these species together just to get like a nutritional balance for the livestock. Yeah. And uh, anyway, I thought that was a, that was a bit unique. So, That's good. That's good. Uh, what about any insect attack? Has that changed at all since you've reduced your synthetics here? Were you having any insect attack? No? Yeah, it's interesting. So from where we started, like when I said when we first realize just like just through management you can stop things like uh, you know sap, like sapping insects attacks um, like jacids and aphids and, and, and loose and, and coming up here we don't do hay anymore I still got all the hay here but I don't do it and, and um, but I've still got a lot of loosen in the mix 
and, and it's interesting to watch it now. Like you'll see the insects come through the same ones, the jacid aphids, all of those sort of things, leaf roller, they'll come in and, uh, but there's never got to the point where anymore that I have to worry about it. Like they'll do, they'll come in and you'll see them come and you'll see them go, but they, I'm having not any leaf loss. I don't have the problems that I used to have. So, you know, that, that's all plant health that's doing that. Like it's, and, and having a, um, growing amongst other species, I'm, I'm sure that's just having this beneficial like, uh, effect on all the plants, having other insects in there, plenty of beneficial insects doing the job to suppress any problems or balancing out any problems would be the better word. Yeah. You loosen absolutely loves being in that body species, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, like you see why it goes. And, and I think like the way it grows now and what I do to it compared to how I used to do it to try and get high production and you think like I get so the loosening here is ten times better than what it used to look. And, and and that's when I was looking after it back then and, and now I just let it go and yeah, it, it certainly You're still looking after it, you're still looking after it. In, in a different, different way, way Jane, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. Sorry, I'll correct that. It's you know a, what I'm like, you've learned a lot about yeah, me. Yeah, I've learned today. a lot today, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's just I, I I just let it get on with it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Best way to describe it. Yeah. yeah. And Alicia, your um, wife, yeah. she works off the farm, but she does love the farm. Um, how does she get involved in the farm? Yeah, well, she um, fairly busy all the time, but her, her passion at the moment is bees. So it's it's an amazing uh, little journey she's been on with bees. Uh, she's got a nice little uh, uh, enterprise going on the side, and it just complements what we do because every beekeeper, one of their biggest issues is what are you going to feed them if things get dry. And, and we looked at what we've got going here and, and, and especially uh, the clovers and the lucens when they flower, because you're grazing, not everything gets grazed every grazing, so there's always flowers on the go. And so the bees, they've just got a smaller sport every day. They get, they free choice. Out. Free choice. They head out <laughs> and they've got everything they need. Yeah. And it's funny to look at the honey like, and, and to go through the, the frames of actually some of the, some of the honey, uh, some of the honey is dark, others is light. And you're just like, we, we, we still haven't worked out where everything's coming from, but the bees are obviously got um, you know, a selection process in place. Yeah. Certain hives are liking certain um, pollinators or whatever. And it, it's interesting, I just thought that, that's fascinating. They, they, they're all going very little distance, but they're all coming back with different types of honey. So, mm. yeah, from different Again, plants. they know what they're doing. They know what they want, yeah. Yep. But it's, and I'm mean, at least you had all the jars lined up on the table there one day, and dark light, dark medium. So it's just, it just amazing, and it all came out of one hive. Yeah. yeah off, off a flow hive, like with a different, with a different, um, 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 what do you call them? Um, anyway, the different parts of the hive. Yeah, yeah the, I don't know what they're called. Frames, it, sorry. Frames, frames. frames. Yeah, I'm yes, thinking frames. frames. Obviously, I, you can tell I don't do the bees. <laughs> I was going to ask you, do you do much with the bees at no, all? No, not at all. No, no, that's that's Alicia's thing. And yeah, yeah um, I'll, um, I just. I'm just make sure that they've got food. That's that's my. I find that my job. Yeah. I think, um, and I'm quite happy to do that. And it's interesting. Like I say that, but I don't really have to do anything different. Of what we're already doing, we're just and it, and you can just say we're walk, working with nature big time. Yeah. You know, we're just we're just. It's just another compliment in the system. Yeah. Mm. Mm. What's your next steps and dreams with that? I would like to introduce more species, like like animals. So another production. So I, I don't know how wet or what yet. I'd also like to increase what we're doing. So probably wouldn't say increase production, but probably add diversity. Add diversity, yeah, through the different stock. Uh, that's something we'd like to do. Um, we know you have a few sheep. Out there. Yeah, you got some sheep. Yeah. There's nothing serious. No, no, just for this. It's, yeah, that's something. And. There's, there's, a, there's a million things you could do. I mean, what we choose to do, I don't know, but there's definitely some things we'd like to change, and that'll all just add to the system. You know, if we can just get more different types of livestock, same thing, it's just a multi-species of livestock. We, you know, anyone that does regen knows that how beneficial that is. So, they, they, we can never say no to anything. It's mm. just what, what we will find that will work for us and complement our lifestyle. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, do the kids get involved at all? Yeah, that's that's right. Um, our eldest son, he's thirteen now, and he um, he's doing ag at school. And and, and the, the teacher last year asked him who he's doing ag, and she uh, he said yes, and she said, oh, that's great. We need you there because he can talk about regen. So, and I, I don't. Well, I guess I talk a fair bit about it because. Um, it's sometimes it's interesting to listen to him. He, he just stands in the background and doesn't ask many questions, but he's taken a lot in. So, it, and it makes me feel good that 
the youngest ones when we were making some bioferts at one stage there and, and, and uh, they were going to school and telling them how they made fertiliser on the weekend. And, uh, and the second eldest boy, he uh, had a little plot growing at the school. They had plots there that they could put plants in it. And, and the other, and he had his best mate was growing wheat. And it's funny, he said, oh, we'll grow some wheat. So he got some wheat and it came in, it was pink. It was being, of course, yeah. it was coated with all the, 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 the industrial insects or whatever it was. And, and I, I grabbed some of ours, which was just, of course, uncoated. And then we got some worm juice and a bit of fish. And, and he had one end of the garden and uh, the other boy had the other half. And so I thought, they didn't realise it, but we're just doing a bit of an experiment here. Yeah. So so they, they planted them and watered them up and they and his, the other boys took off and ours was there. And, and, and the, but Ben, the middle boy, he's like, oh, it's not going as well. And I said, just, just leave it, give it time. and. When I got up a bit, I said, right, and I gave him a little bottle of um, worm extract. I said, go in there and put that in the watering can and give it the water. And he did that and away they went. And, and it's interesting, the crops grew up and then it got to the point the other one just stopped. And then his just kept going and going. And then he was starting to worry. He said, it, it, it hasn't dried out. It's, you know, when am I going to get a, a decent head? And I said, <laughs> <laughs> like, just give it time. And anyway, they didn't realise, but then, um, yeah, it was just a, an experiment we did. And, and I thought, oh, it'd be nice that if other kids had actually seen that or knew what was going on. But uh, yeah, and I thought, well, that's a great way for kids to learn. I yeah. think. And they're, they're learning that now. That, like, uh, uh, he was only 11 doing that. And I'm thinking that that's what it's all about. That's the next generation coming on. And he's going to grow up. Only knowing that any fertiliser to use is something that you could make or, or a natural base or something like that and, and not, not something you have to buy from a, from a warehouse or something like that. So I think that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, that's amazing. That's mm. amazing. Yeah, it is, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Uh, your, your hopes for the group, so the CQLA group, um, do you see us uh, yesterday? I think it's going to grow. I think it's definitely going to grow. Mm. <laughs> Um, because they saw, you know, what, what type of things that you guys were looking into and the absolute enthusiasm of your group. Mm -hmm. um, what's your dreams for it? What do you see happening? Yeah, uh, yeah Nicola, I, like you, you've got to dream big. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't cost anything and it, you've got to do it. And, and I, I just love the group and I love the people we've got in it. And, and to have that together, we've been a couple of years now and, and we just all get along. Um, and I was only just saying to one of the other members yesterday, it doesn't matter who's not here because a couple of members weren't there that are vital to the group, but we still got the job done. And I think that's, that's a real strength that we've got, that we can, there's no one person in charge as such. If, like you, you've got your different positions, but everyone can step up when they have to. So it's good to see that. And I think that's a really good call to have. That's something we can take forward. And, and I think that like the vision we have is just to, just to keep growing, to try and get more farmers across and help them assist them to get them onto this regenerative path. Um, I know we're not going to get everyone, but I just think that more people we can help. And it's not just that, it's to rebuild the communities. And that's what we said earlier about what Anna was doing. It's so vital to get that human health aspect back into it. It's something that um, I'm very passionate about, especially when you can go like from not only just talking about gut health, but that's connected to the mental health. And, and you know, communities have suffered enough over the years, and I think that's something that we need to play a part as, as a group, bring back that community and get that strength and, and get people talking about it. Um, so, you know, bring back healthy food and, and, and um, bring, getting healthy lifestyles back into farming systems. And that's where Regen comes into it because it's, we're about growing things. It's not about um, destroying anything anymore. And just that mindset alone just changes it. Bring the fun back into it. That's one of our... Our requirements to be in our committee that you have to have a sense of humour. So, you all do. Yes, we <laughs> have got to live up to that. Yeah, so don't show up if you're in a bad mood. So, <laughs> and that's fine if you have, but that's but well, that's, that's what we've got to have. Yeah, yeah. You've got to, and you got to have a bit of fun in you and, and, and to make it enjoyable. And just it's not hard work when you're enjoying it. So, but, so yeah, that's where we want to go. We just want to keep growing it with good people and get as many people on board to support them and and, and down this really path. Yeah. yeah. I saw uh, there was a lot of people that said, I'm going to connect with your mum because I, I really want to learn about this gut health. I've got a teenager who's got anxiety or depression or they might have things going on. And I had a lot of people see connecting with Jane, like the number of people that I see that they're going to call her about um, working on themselves before yeah. they can start working in this energetic space. Mm. So just this amazing open group. It's like they've already made that transition off the synthetics. They know that that life force energy is so important, diversity is important, and now they're going, okay, my health is important and how I think and yeah. feel. 
That's right. And make intuitive decisions is important too. That's right. Yeah, and Emma, when, like, when she worked with me originally there, that's when I first met her and you know, she made that comment, Dara, like, I don't know how you can make a good decision when you're feeling the way you do. And I thought, well, that, that's a bit in that. Like, well, how can we be good farmers if we're struggling ourselves? Mm. And, uh, and I think that was, that was something. And interesting, at the last workshop we did, we got Emma to do us, well, it was only a five minute speech. But afterwards, you know, there's, like, there was women coming up there and I said, oh, I need, I need to know more because my husband, he's struggling, he's suffering, you know, whether it's chemical exposure or whatever it might be. And, but they're, they're too proud to say anything. And I think, well, we're getting through, you know, we're, we're breaking that barrier down. So, and I think that was great. And that's why after that, that was a spur of the moment, just a bit of a filler in the, in the event. And that's when I realised, like, we need to get Emma on the main stage, not just a filler. When I saw the response that we got from people, um, yeah, just and, and then, yeah, people just coming up afterwards and just, oh, I need to talk to you. I need, we need help, mm. and and really they just don't know where to go. And it's that that um, just that expectations of community still that that it's stigma that you know we can't open up too much. We, you know, we need to break that down. And, and I, we did that yesterday in a big way. I think you yeah. really did. Yeah. yeah, yeah. At the end of the day, I asked the crowd of, I don't know, was it. 70, 80 people, 80 something people, I said, who now feels more free? And so many hands went up and I said, who's feeling frustrated? Because sometimes people feel frustrated. Mm. They're like, oh, you can't do this. This isn't possible. I've tried it. It doesn't work. And no one raised their hand. They may have been there just feeling, you know, and they didn't say anything. And didn't feel comfortable to put their hand up. Yeah, potentially. And it's okay to have people feel frustrated Mm. because that's what brings these discussions out and you can move through that and grow even more. Um, but what a group, you know, yeah. and yeah. if people want to get involved, Dale, how do they contact the group? Yeah, they can, um, so we, we're on, online there, so it's Central Queensland Landscape Alliance, um, yeah, on Facebook as well, so yeah, we can just um, send us, shoot us an email, yeah, it's more than happy to have anyone on board, and yeah, we just try to run three main events a year, and, and two smaller ones, so, we, so we're also doing the farm walks, like get that community group happening, and so that's, that's what we're trying to do and, 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 and bring a real benefit to, to members. To, to I like in your group too, Vic No-Till down in Victoria, they're an amazing group and I can see that Queensland can grow a group like that. And it really is from the top of Queensland to the bottom of Queensland. You have people coming from Brisbane mm. and all over. Yeah. And four, out, four or five hours out west. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. That was just, yeah. 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 And, and one thing I, I will say, like our group, we're not, we're not there to out-compete any other group or anything else. And we're actually talking to other regenerative groups at the moment about doing partnerships again, just like we've done with Nutrisoil. Like, I mean, that was just an absolute outstanding success. I I just couldn't believe just how well that worked. So that's given us inspiration to go further and talk with other regen groups. So we're all there to share a good story and and communicate. It's not about one being better than the other. And and I often say that we're not... No, no one's better than anyone else in this. It's just that some are further down the journey, the region journey, than others, but that doesn't make them a better person than the next person that's on board. Yeah. But we're, all, we're all just trying to get there and we're all trying to make a better place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're an amazing group of people and you're attracting amazing people mm. uh, to your group. So it's wonderful. Well done. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks Dan. Yeah. <laughs>